Our scripture reading this morning is in two parts. First is Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20, and can be found on page 989 in the Pew Bibles. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And the second is Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, and that can be found on page 1077. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of his word. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty creator, God of us all, we ask you to stretch our imaginations, to sense the majesty and the mystery of your work in our world, <clears throat> in our church, and in our lives. Help us to perceive you in all that we see and all that we hear, especially now as we seek your wisdom and guidance. Speak to us now, O Lord our God, and let everything else fall away. Amen. So last week, you may or may not remember, we began a discussion and it's one that I'm hoping we will continue together throughout the entire year, because it was the first Sunday of the year. This is something that I'm hoping we'll talk about for, for many, many, many weeks and months to come. Because it's a discussion that's deeply critical to each of us, not only in our individual lives, but in our collective lives as a church family, as a, as a faith community. And what it is we started talking about was specifically what it is that Christ calls us to as his followers. Because like I said last week, it seems sometimes like we're not really super clear on what exactly that might be. Well, the totality of it anyways. We, we know that Christ calls us into relationship with him so that we will grow in our faith and become more like, like him. We know he calls us to prayer and awareness of the Holy Spirit's movement in our lives, and, and he calls us to live our lives according to and, and, and through the gospel. We're pretty clear on that. But there are too many times, it seems, that as important as all that is, I in no way want to imply that that's not deeply important, but it, sometimes it seems like too many, that, that, that we let the emphasis on our personal walk with Jesus overshadow the rest of what he calls us to do. And we know that to be feeding the hungry, things like that, comforting the grieving, welcoming the stranger, fighting and resisting evil and injustice and oppression wherever we find it, reaching out to love our neighbors. We know that. And I'm not saying in any way that, that we don't have that in our mind and, and awareness of what Jesus calls us to do in that way, nor am I saying that there aren't people here today, in fact, possibly every single person here today, we all, that, that, we, that don't heed the call. Indeed, there are plenty in this congregation who have sacrificed more than anyone will ever know to be in service to Christ according to what the phrase feed my sheep means in the situation that presents itself to them. They are in service in that way. But whether we want to admit it or not, whether we really want to pay attention to it or not, we live in a society that is constantly working against us 
in our call to what Christ calls us in the world. We live in a hyper alert, overscheduled, acutely anxious culture that is now beginning to devolve into obsessive misanthropy that is bent on, on tearing each other down, breaking each other apart instead of lifting each other up and putting people back together. It's no wonder that we're in protection mode. It's no wonder that we isolate ourselves more and more and more in, in all kinds of different ways. We, we do it through addiction, and that's not just talking about substance abuse or, or any other kind of, you know, the, the kinds of addictions we usually, we can be addicted to anything. Anything that takes over our lives is an addiction. And we can also hide ourselves in social media, which by the way, is an addiction, can be anyways. We might hide ourselves in our work. We might just completely obsessive over our work so that we don't have to think about all of that noise out there. We might find ourselves wrapped up in something, whatever it is, that makes us not have to think about what's going on out there. Because quite frankly, sometimes it's too much. Sometimes it's just so hard to take. And so we, 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 we go into our caves, we go into our cocoons, whatever metaphor you want. We hide from the world. But it's really hard to love our neighbor if we won't go outside the house. You may be safer with the doors and the locked and the window shades drawn, but you're not who Jesus is calling you to be. You're not where Jesus is calling you to be. You've heard the, say the saying, perhaps, that a ship in the harbor is safe but that's not what ships are built for. In the same way, a church is safe only if it worries about its building and, and the color of its carpet or its walls, but that's not what churches are built for. What then exactly are they built for? I mean, really, and I know that sounds like a silly question because we're here. And most of us have been in a church most of our lives. But think about it. What exactly is a church supposed to be and do or not be and not do in order to be able to call itself a church? Because believe it or not, there are a lot of answers to that question. Sometimes there's as many answers to that question as there are people in the church. There's at least more answers, more ideas anyways, than we might expect. So it's harder than maybe it should be for us to figure out, figure out what exactly it is. And then the hardest part of all is to agree on it, how exactly the church is called to be in the world. And more specifically, how is our church called to be in the world? I'm going to go through a little bit of a history lesson. And in first service, everybody kind of glazed over. Just stick with me. <laughs> this isn't going to last too long. But it, 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 we're going to just talk about it a little bit. But since it began almost 2,000 years ago, Christians have been trying and failing to figure out, fighting and sometimes dying over, and seeking and only occasionally finding what it means to be the church. Honestly, we've gotten it wrong a lot more than we've gotten it right. It started with a handful of fishermen, some tax collectors, and several youthful troublemakers in some obscure province in the Middle East. But since then, over the course of the years, it has become the, lar the third, it, it, has, it has grown to include at least a third of the population of the earth. And so it's very important for us to know that. And that's not just individual Christians. We consider that the entire church. We consider that the body of Christ. In its very early form, in the first century, Christianity wasn't even a church properly organized. It was a movement, and it was known as the way. It grew very quickly, and it grew in every direction. It grew geographically. It grew socially. Any way you can think of, it grew. And it grew like wildfire. And then it finally took, took roots and it began to organize. And so house churches started to break out. And this is how it began to really begin to be organized. But back then, no matter how big it got, it was only one church, unified in spirit and in vision. 
And eventually, it started to be kind of known as the Catholic Church. And here's why. Because Catholic at the time, and still is to, to some extent, um, considered it, it, is a, it is another word for saying universal. And so that was the way to say that there was one church, one universal church. It also kind of implied in its own way, not as much as it would later in the years, but it also kind of implied a certain type of orthodoxy, that there was a way that we did things in church, and that was because there were a lot of heretical groups starting to pop up. A lot of people starting to pop up and do things on their own and kind of work against what it was, the message of the way, and so they had to really define themselves in order to speak against that. Now, in those earliest centuries, to admit being a Christian meant that you knew there was a really definite possibility that you were going to be persecuted and possibly even martyred. Christians were violently beaten and put to the most horrific of deaths. It was horrible. But those early Christians, they adhered so completely to their beliefs that they were willing to die for. That's how important it was that they keep this going. And it was their faith that built the very first church, even though they might have not had a building. They understood what it meant to build the church. Now, in the year 312, there was a um, interesting and, and rather ironic twist in the story. When the Roman Emperor Constantine he entered our narrative. Legend has it that he had a dream the night before a very important battle. Now, what you need to know about Constantine is prior to this, he was a pagan and that he worshipped the sun. And in this dream, he saw his sun god, but then he saw the cross in front of the sun god, transposed in front of the sun. And beneath it were the words, hoc signo vinces. Which, which means, in this sign prevail. And so the next morning, he ran out to all of his warriors, and he made them paint crosses on their shields. And they marched out together as Christian soldiers. And they absolutely crushed their enemy in that battle. And so Constantine took it to mean that this was a sign and that he was supposed to be Christian. And not surprisingly, because he was the Roman emperor, by the end of that century, the entire Roman Empire was Christian. And that's how Christianity really kind of started to take hold and really become, began to, to move out of the house, house churches and become more of a regular church. It had officially moved out of the catacombs and into the palaces. Now, the church um, learned a lot under Constantine. Um, some good and maybe some not so good. Um, the church learned how to appeal to the masses, for instance. It was very important to get the message out further and further because now it was a legitimate thing. Christians were no longer being fed to lions, but now you could actually, you know, have open Christian worship services. And so they learned what that meant. They, that the um, Constantine kind of uh, helped them through that, that transition. They also learned what it meant to appeal to seats of power. And perhaps that wasn't one of the better things that eventually um, came of what they learned from Constantine, but they did learn about that time. And this was also the, the time where, if you've heard, if you've heard our creeds and, and everything and our doctrines and stuff, this is where the councils of the church had begun right about this time. And so those creeds, those Nicene Creed, the, the Apostles' Creed, what we, those, this is when the, those councils wrote those creeds, and we still say them to, the, to this day. That's, that's when that all came along. Now, not everybody was on board, though, with this uh, brand new uh, brand of Christianity, this flashy and powerful brand of organized Christianity. Most people grabbed onto it, but there were some that didn't. And they desperately craved a return to the purity of that original movement called the Way. And so they fled into the wilderness, and they found caves, and that's where they spent the rest of their lives. And it was a, it was a, it was, it was a kind of monastic community of what we might say is a monastic community. Now, it's actually where monasticism begins. Those people are known as the desert fathers and mothers, and a lot of their writings have influenced centuries of Christians looking for a more simple and pure faith. And, and, and their, their, their monastic movement continues even to this day. But they weren't the only ones that disagreed with the direction of the church. Oh, no. Over the course of the next century, 
there was a lot of divides that happened. For one, for instance, um, the the there were Gre the the two main um, uh, uh, folks that were in the church together were the Greeks and the Romans, and they started to argue about how to do church. And so the Greeks went off one way and be, and started the Eastern Orthodox Church, and the and and the Romans went off the other way in the Western Church, which is where we're descended from. Um, that was uh, the first great schism of the church, happened in 1054. And just a few centuries later, the next great split, which is another way of saying schism, came in the form of the Protestant Reformation. And that was when a young monk named Martin Luther, he staged what turned out to be an absolutely seismic protest against the Catholic Church. It was based on things like doctrines on salvation, the hierarchical structure, the role of the pope, the role of the saints, the elevation of church tradition to the same level as that of the Bible, it's scripture. He had a whole list, 95, 95 theses, 95 things he was very frustrated about, and he, and he nailed them to the door of a church. But the Catholic church didn't let them go without a fight. And in one way or another, the, that struggle continued over the next century or so. And, and we're talking wars and just some serious ugliness. And when the dust settled from all of that, the roots of all of the mainline Protestant denominations had been planted. They had started to take hold. And so this is how we kind of learn our, our history. And, and, and thanks for sticking with me. I saw you guys really trying to stick with me. That was good. You guys did great. Um, but there's a reason why I wanted to tell you all of that. And here's why. Over all the centuries, over those two millennia, those 2,000 years, over all that fighting and all that blood spilled and all that arguing, everything, we're still arguing. We continue to argue all of that. We think somehow that we've arrived and all of that is, is in our history. No, it's our present because we continue to argue and argue and argue over literally everything. Baptism, marriage, all kinds of doctrinal, doctrinal arguments, the color of the walls in the sanctuary, the carpet, something like that, music, acceptable dishes to bring to the covered dish dinner. We, we, are, we will find something. I'm not kidding, we have covered it all. You name an issue and we have fought over it. I guarantee it. In some cases, even over the small stuff, people have lost their lives. People get very impassioned when it comes to things they think is supposed to happen in the church. It gets nasty. Church people can be mean. And I promise you, whatever it is that your grievance with the church, someone has taken it so much further than you could even imagine. They have taken it possibly to an extreme that might even make you uncomfortable. Even though when the grievance began, you shared that grievance with them. And these are good people too. These are respectable people. People you might even let in your house. But if you accidentally touch that, sp that sore spot on them, you better watch out. You're going to get it. And you know what? That is what a lot of people out there see when they look in. They see a bunch of people arguing over the way ministry should or shouldn't be done rather than a bunch of people out in the world actually doing ministry. And the people that aren't in the church, they don't want anything to do with all that bickering. And can you blame them? People out there are hurting and they need to feel the love of Christ, but all they see is all this arguing over all manners of things, large and small. They are hungry, they are cold, they are lost, and they won't come in because sometimes it's better out there than it is in here, period. That's just a reality. Which brings us back to that question I asked you just a little while ago. What then exactly are churches built for? What is it that a church is supposed to be or do or not be or not do in order to call themselves a church? Well, we can, just as all of our ancestors in faith have done, 
we can pick that question up and we can turn it around, we can hold it up to the light and we can turn it over and see it from every single angle. We can argue about it for days or years or millennia. We can storm off and call each other names. But ultimately, we're going to have to admit that we knew the answer to that question before it was even asked. Matthew 28, 16 through 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. But when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. That is what the church is built for. Period. We stand around arguing and wringing our hands about the right and the proper ways to do things. And I kind of feel like Jesus is standing off to the side, shaking his head, saying, guys, what are you doing? I told you what to do. What is all this other stuff? What are you doing? Vince Lombardi was famous for starting every Green Bay Packer season by holding up a football and saying, gentlemen, this is a football. And the point was that they needed to get back to the very basics, to the foundation for everything else that would follow. They needed to remember why they were there. This is a football. Jesus' conversation to his disciples at the end of Matthew 28 is his, this is a football speech. Now bear in mind, this morning's reading comes not only at the end of Matthew 28, but at the end of the entire Gospel of Matthew. In other words, according to Matthew's account of Jesus' life and ministry, these were Jesus' last words to his followers. So you know he chose them carefully. Listen to them one more time. All authority in heaven and earth are given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey, to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus' last words to his followers were not, go and make yourselves as comfortable as possible and try to do something good every once in a while. They were not, go and make pla plaques and posters of everything I say, and yet tell everybody who would truly like to seek me that they need to be just like me, just like you. Jesus said, go and make disciples. Not just converts, disciples. Followers of Christ who are both hearers and doers of the word. And just how are we supposed to do that? Well, by baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. But that doesn't mean just pouring water on them. It means inviting them to bury their old life and rise to a new one, to make a commitment to follow Jesus in every part of their lives so that they might be soaked in the grace and the passion of God through Christ. And it means for us to create a space for them to find their way, to discern that invitation, to be able to come to that point where they're ready to make that commitment. Jesus tells them to teach them, Jesus tells us and the disciples, to teach them to obey his commandments. And if there's any, ever, ever any question as to what Jesus commanded, Matthew 22, 36, 40, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in all the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Where's the confusion? This is a football. Now I'm not saying that realistically, that being a church 
can be reduced in real life to something so simple, to such a simple equation. I realize that. I know that we all wish that it could, but being a church does bring with it certain complications. Because we all know that where two or more are gathered, somebody's going to make somebody else mad. It's just a reality of life. But no matter how clumsy or messy the people of the church might be, the church itself is built on Jesus' final words in the Gospel of Matthew. This is our mission, and this is our calling. Now, last week we talked about how important it is for a congregation to engage in the life of, its church, uh, in the, life of the church, how people's willingness to step into servant leadership roles makes all the difference between a thriving church and a dying church. And I want to reiterate, take a moment to reiterate, if you are feeling a tug in your spirit, sensing a call from God for you to serve at Advent Church as your pastor, I am personally asking you to tune into that. I'm personally asking you to let me or one of the members of the leadership team know that because your church needs you. We need you. But just as important as it is that a congregation engage in the life of a church, it is equally important that a congregation engage in the mission of a church. The earliest church before it was even a church thrived and it spread like wildfire because it was entirely focused on Jesus' instructions to them, go and make disciples. And many of those folks went as far as to risk or even lose their life over it. That's how important it was to follow Jesus' instruction and go and make disciples. In the centuries since, though, it seems as though the people of the church have become more and more focused on defining the dividing lines than stepping over those lines so that we can embrace each other. And I'm sorry to belabor a metaphor, but it kind of seems like maybe we've taken our eye off the ball. But notice that Jesus added one more thing to those instructions in Matthew 28. He wasn't done. He wanted us to know one more thing. And I am with you always, to the very end of the age. Those were his final words. The last thing that his human voice carried into the air around them. And it hung there. You could still hear it even after he was gone. And no matter how tangled up our feet may get as we try to walk this path together, those words are still hanging in the air around us. He didn't shout some orders at us and then leave us hanging. He never intended for us to have to figure this out all by ourselves. He's still here. He's guiding our feet and he's ordering our steps, telling us what to do, even, and we have to admit, if we don't want to listen all the time, He's still calling us to care for the needy and comfort the grieving and welcome the stranger and fight and resist evil and injustice and oppression in all its forms and to reach out and to love our neighbors. He is still calling us to our mission every moment of every day. There is no questioning his call, nor is there any questioning his presence with us as we answer that call. The only question we have is whether or not we will answer. Let us pray. Almighty creator, God of us all, you call us to be your light in the darkness, your voice in the wilderness, your hope for the hopeless. You give us strength in our weakness, peace and gentleness, words and boldness, to proclaim more of you and less of us as your church, the body of Christ. Order our steps to draw us in line with your will for what is to be our place in our community and in our world. <laughs>
We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs>